in, in the Jewish calendar, this is a very interesting period, because today begins a new month, Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first day of the last month of the Hebrew calendar known as Elul, which is the last month of the year. And at the end of this month begins the new month, the new year, 5774, which we celebrate with Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of a month and the beginning of a year known as the month of Tishrei. Rosh Hashanah is two days, and that is even in Israel, where usually the festivities are one day. And after Rosh Hashanah, we have what's known as Aseret Yemei Tshuva, the ten days of reflection, or re return, or some say repentance, but I'm not fond of that translation. I think ten days of, of returning to the self is more accurate. Tshuva means return, not repentance. And following that comes the exciting day of Yom Kippur, which is followed by a little break, just of four days, which brings us into the holiday of Sukkot, seven days of joyous festivities where we eat outside in the hut and we shake willows and citrons. And it's as follows by Shmini Atzeret and Simchat Torah, when we dance endlessly with the Torah known as the Hakafot. And then comes the day after the holiday known as Isruchag, and then starts a new period in the Jewish calendar, the month of Cheshvan, which in many ways is a downer. It's the only Jewish month in the year that doesn't even have one unique or special day. The month of Cheshvan is the most boring month in the Jewish calendar. Right after the month that is filled with one holiday after another holiday, Elul, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, days of re return, Sukkot, Simchat Torah, etc., how are we to understand this cycle of days, of holy days, of holidays? And I think the best way to explain it is in terms of human relationships, in terms of marriage. Of course, marriage doesn't begin with marriage. Marriage begins with courtship. Dating, what they used to call courtship. You date... You spend time with each other. How long do you date? Depends where you live. West side of Manhattan, 25 years. <laughs> Los Angeles, 18 years. Williamsburg, three hours. <laughs> it depends where you live. And I don't know whose marriages are doing better. Actually, I do know, but that's a separate subject. <laughs> Cron Heights, somewhere in the middle. I don't know. <laughs> Two months, three months, four months, six months, okay. But you date, and then you propose, right? You remember? You remember? I'm trying to bring back sweet memories. You propose, you take out the champagne, you take out the bouquet of 149 roses, red roses. You didn't do that? You could do it over. <laughs> I love you, I want to be with you, would you marry me? Hopefully she says yes. My wife says I have to think about it. Okay. She still says that. But uh, hopefully she says yes, and then you get ready for the wedding. A wedding has two sides to it. There's the first part of the wedding in the Jewish tradition, which is more solemn, more somber. The groom veils the bride. There's the chuppah. There's a sense of intensity. And then afterwards is the dancing and the festivities and the lechayims and the eating and the lively part of the wedding and the pictures, and the fun, and that concludes with Sheva Brachot, seven days of festivities and blessings, and then the party is over, and you go on the honeymoon, and life begins. This exact scenario is what happens at this time of the year. The month of Elul is the month of dating between God and his children, between God and his people. Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, the founder of the Chabad movement, who passed away in 1812, 200 years ago, writes that during the month of Elul, he gives a public, a lovely parable. The king is in the field. What he means is, you know how presidents, when they're campaigning, during campaign season, they're accessible? You know what I mean? They don't wear a tie, they hang out with Joe the plumber, they hang out with the ordinary folk, 
how are you? Of course, it's a tool in the campaigning promotions. I'm a great guy. I'm accessible. I'm calm. I'm serene. I'm one of you. I love you. You love me. Read my lips, etc. But that's the human president who has his flaws. On a deeper level, in the month of Elul, Rabbi Shnei Zalman says, God dates us. We're on a date. There's a certain accessibility of the presence of the divine that doesn't exist all year. It's like the king comes out of the field. You know when men date, they are directed by their sister the first time how to do it, right? And they put on a friendly demeanor during the dating. They open the door for you. And they look at you, and they ask you how you've been, and they listen to you quetching. You know, a woman once said she stopped dating. Why? She said, he took me on a date. For three hours, he was talking about himself. After three hours, he turns to me and he says, it's enough of me talking about myself. Let me hear, what do you have to say about me? (laughs) And that was the end of it. But most men, at least during dating, can disprove Charles Darwin, at least for a little bit. And demonstrate empathy. So dating is actually a time when in a very casual way, you get to know each other, not in a formal way, but in a casual way. And Rabbi Shnei Zalman says in the month of Elul, the king comes into the field. What does he mean into the field? Into the hearts and lives of his people, allowing a very intimate and casual type of accessibility and relationship. This is this month, very special month. God doesn't believe in long dating. So after four weeks of the month of Elul, he proposes. That's the night of Rosh Hashanah. The night of Rosh Hashanah, basically, what is the energy of Rosh Hashanah night? God proposes. He turns to the Jew and he says, I'm crazy about you. Don't ask me why, it doesn't make sense. But I'm madly in love with you. I want to marry you. Would you marry me? The Jew looks at God and says, listen, God, you know, you could be a nice guy at times, but I think let's keep it to the dating. You know, what do we have to get into this whole marriage thing? God says, listen, if you want, we could be dating for the rest of history. You know, dating is non-committal. You pick me up twice a week. We spend three, four hours. We don't like each other. We part ways. But I think we belong with each other. Because if you date your whole life, you will never become the person you're capable of becoming. If you date your whole life, you will never experience the blessings in life that come through an absolute, unequivocal, committed relationship. You and I belong with each other. Would you marry me? And the Jews tell God, give me one night to think about it. And that's the night of Rosh Hashanah. The Kabbalists say the night of Rosh Hashanah is a very vulnerable night. The great mystics would fall asleep that night because there is a cosmic weakness in the world because the world is what's known in a state of slumber because all of existence hangs on this verdict. Will the bride say yes or will she say no? And the world hangs in balance. Rosh Hashanah morning, we tell God, we have an answer. We take a ram's horn and we go, do! We have an answer. And the answer is, yes. God says, okay, let's get this over with. A few days to prepare for the wedding. How long? Ten days. Okay, God has connections with a good caterer, a good florist, a good photographer. Ain't sve dry, one, two, three. Yom Kippur is the chuppah, the wedding, the marital ceremony. Of course, before you get married, you have to do some introspection. People who think when they get married, all their issues will be gone because of the relationship are sorely mistaken. If you have your own insecurities and demons and skeletons, your spouse cannot take them away from you. Often marriages become parasitic, where you feed off other people's energy. You have to be wholesome within yourself. 
in order to build a relationship with somebody else. And that's why we begin Yom Kippur with which prayer? What is it called? Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre is an Aramaic statement, and it's considered the holiest moment in the Jewish calendar, Kol Nidre. In fact, Jews who will not show up in synagogue all year show up to Kol Nidre. But how many of you have ever actually read the English translation of Kol Nidre? Do you know what it says? Here goes. All the promises, all the pledges, all the oaths, all the commitments that I plan to accept upon myself from this Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur are null, void, meaningless, inconsequential, no promises, no pledges, no oaths. Whoa. It's like basically you can't trust a word I say. Now, practically the reason is the Torah is very serious about people's words. And when I make an oath, I make a commitment, I say I'm going to do this, I am obligated not to violate my word. And therefore, since people are always making promises, right? I'm not going to have any cheesecake throughout the retreat. You know that promise? No carbs. I saw you taking four blintzes this morning. Who are you fooling? And you had to take four, you couldn't take one? Yeah, you. So, uh, so what we do is, on the onset of Yom Kippur, we say, all the promises I make are not promises that way. We're not violating the sin of violating our words, which is a biblical transgression. Granted. I understand the value of it. But this is the holiest moment in the Jewish calendar. Now, do you remember the melody of Kol Nidre? The melody of Kol Nidre is one of the most stirring Jewish melodies. When you match the melody to the lyrics, it becomes almost incomprehensible. And I'll just demonstrate it to you, and you'll forgive my voice, with that one stanza to convey what I'm trying to say. At the end of Kol Nidre we say, Nidrana la Nidre asarana la asarish wasana la shavuot. My promises are not promises. My pledges are no pledges. My oaths are no oaths. Now listen to the melody. And I'm going to do it in English so you'll get it. My promises are not promises, I, and my pledges are not pledges, I, 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 Ay 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 and my oaths are not oaths Gewalt We reach that peak that zenith and what's the declaration Shvikin, shvisin, ptelinim of a tolen, nullify all my voids. La shiri, they have no validity and no existence. Imagine somebody comes over to you and says, Can you pay me back? You come over to them, can you pay me back the loan? I lent you $20,000. Lame is Rob. My promises are no promises. My pledges are no pledges. Forget, forget, forget about your money for all of eternity. I oh, never take any of my words so oh, seriously. Now, <laughs> call it whatever you want. But the holiest moment of the year? <laughs> What's the message? My dear friends, Kol Nidre captures one of the profound ideas in Judaism, and that is, we each have pledges and promises and oaths that we take not to other people. 
that we take to ourselves. We all look in the mirror and say, I cannot do this. We feel bound by the shackles of our past, by the bruises and wounds that we may have experienced in childhood, by the hypocrisy or self-centeredness that we have seen, by the pain that we have endured throughout our life and we become as a result maimed psychologically, wounded emotionally. We feel we cannot be truly free, truly happy, truly confident, truly optimistic, truly wholesome. We cannot become the authors of our own biography as we are victims to the past experiences of our lives. But to be in a marriage with God means that you are in marriage with something that is completely free uninhibited, infinite. Judaism has no definition for God. The word God itself is a terrible phrase, you know that. Because the term God sounds like we know what we're talking about. The only definition Judaism gives to God is that he has no definition. That's our only definition for God. Hence, it's an invitation to infinity, to endless mystery. The definition of God is means that wherever you are in life, there is something more, there is something greater, there is something deeper yet. There is another layer that has to be unraveled. So when the Bible says man was created in God's image, I ask you now a simple question. This is a quote from Genesis. How many times does Moses admonish the Jews in the Bible? Not to create an image of God. Again and again and again. God has no images, no statues, no pictures. Unlike the pagans who depicted their gods in images and statues and constellations and heavenly or earthly bodies. You don't make an image of God. So how does Genesis say man was created in God's image? I thought God has no image. So I want you to open your minds and open your hearts and let's understand what this means. In a most elegant and sophisticated way, what Judaism is saying is, the human being was created in God's image, but God has no image. That's exactly the point. The human being was created in the image of the one who has no image, which means we have no image. Which means... When I look in the mirror and I say, of course I have an image. I have an identity. There are certain things I could do. There are certain things I can do. There are certain fears and insecurities that hold me down. This is my image. Judaism says, no. That is a superimposed image. You have a freedom within you that you can discover if you will find that part of you that was created in God's image who has no image, and therefore I can create my image. I can choose my image. Who I was yesterday does not define conclusively who I must be today. I can become the author of my own biography, the author of my own destiny, that is kol nidre. A marriage with God, before you enter into the chuppah, you first have to say, all the oaths that I have made about myself, I can't, I'm paralyzed, I'm stuck, I'm incapable, I'm just the narcissistic type. I once asked somebody, why are you doing this? He says, I am the narcissistic type. I said, really? Is that type A or type B of your blood? You're the narcissistic type? I once asked somebody, why are you doing what you're doing? He says, I'm a neurotic. So I told him there are psychotics, neurotics, and psychiatrists. The difference is the psychotic builds castles in the air. The neurotic lives in the castles. The psychiatrist collects the rent from both. <laughs> Which is why so many Jews become psychiatrists. <laughs> that is called Nidre. And before you enter into an earthly marriage as well, 
If you have all types of addictions and hang-ups, it's not going to work. So before we go into the chuppah, the first thing we have to say is kol nidre. I'm a free human being. I'm free to choose. I can recreate my image because I am created in the image of the one who is utterly free, unrestrained, uninhibited, infinite. <coughs> that is why on Yom Kippur we dress in white. Because the groom and the bride, especially the bride, is dressed in white. The custom among Jews is that on a wedding day, the groom and the bride fast. On Yom Kippur, we fast. Yom Kippur has a component of solemnness to it. It's an intense day because the beginning of a wedding has intensity. And it culminates with that final prayer of Yom Kippur. What is it called? Ne'ilah. The last prayer. Who knows what Ne'ilah means? Ne'ilah means closure. Why is the last prayer of Yom Kippur called Ne'ilah? Yom Kippur has five prayers. Ma'ariv, Shacharit, Musaf, Mincha, Ne'ilah. Why is it called closure? So our tradition tells us because the sun is about to set, the gates of heaven will soon close. Seize the day, carpe diem, and in Yiddish, and ask God what you want to ask before the sun sets. But there is a deeper component in Ne'ilah, and that is... During that time at the end of Yom Kippur, the gates of heaven close with you inside. During that time, every Jew is alone with God. And that is like the yichud room. You saw ever after a chuppah, what happens after a chuppah? The groom and the bride go into a secluded private room without anybody. Not even the photographer. Not even the mother-in-law goes in. Can you imagine? I mean, she'll be there, God willing, for eternity. But, uh, but she doesn't go into the, It's the groom and the bride alone. That's Ne'ilah. Yom Kippur, the whole Yom Kippur is the chuppah. The end of Yom Kippur is we go in alone with God. And that's why we're not so hungry during those last moments of Yom Kippur. You know, a groom and a bride fast all day. When they come into that yichud room, to that secluded room after the chuppah, there's always some orange juice and horrible danishes. And yet, from all the weddings I have done, they always remain intact. I get to eat them afterwards as the officiating rabbi. Because the adrenaline flow, the excitement of just being married to each other, removes from them the need to eat. You'll see Yom Kippur, Jews are hungry all day. And they're always complaining, I just want a cup of water. You ever saw my head, my house, your family, my head, my chest, my heart, my feet, my legs. <laughs> they didn't eat for 30 minutes. They're going with sugar. You know? <laughs> and you ever saw how Jews eat before Yom Kippur and after Yom Kippur? You ever saw? Do you know that we have a mitzvah to eat before Yom Kippur? We have a mitzvah to eat after Yom Kippur. But 30 minutes into the fast, every Jew is walking around, I just need a little water. Have you seen water anywhere? Does God really care if I have a drink of water? All right, what are you going to do with our Yiddelach? God bless them. But that time, when Jews this clear, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Hu Elohim, at the end of Yom Kippur, People are not hungry for a few moments because there is an intimacy with God that is undescribable towards the last moments of Yom Kippur. It's the groom and the bride alone in the room. Ne'ilah, the gates of heaven close with you inside. Yom Kippur ends. The chuppah is over. What happens now at a Jewish wedding? The dancing begins. So from Yom Kippur we go into Sukkot. Why do we have four days in between? Pictures. <laughs> Sukkot, seven days of celebration and dancing. Amachaya, we have what's known as Simchat Beis HaShoeva, Jews dance in the streets and in the shuls, a very, very special time Sukkot. What is it? It's not detached from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It is the celebration of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's not two religions. Elul, God does the dating. Rosh Hashanah, proposal and commitment. 
Yom Kippur, the chuppah and the marriage ceremony, and the secluding room at the end, Sukkot, the party, the festivities, the dancing. In many ways, what's the deepest moment of a relationship? The commitment. When you say yes, and that's Rosh Hashanah, saying yes, that's a very profound moment. Because you have to realize the way Jews look at the concept of a relationship. And this is a striking difference between what is so prevalent in culture today. Namely, from the Jewish perspective, although the Torah does give an option for divorce, but when we enter into a marriage, it's seen as a commitment for life. Do we know divorce is a possibility? Of course. But the commitment is a commitment for life. And that is what allows the love to flourish in a much more profound way. Because when you know that your partner is not going to leave you when something happens, it allows people to be more trusting and more vulnerable and all the inner love to emerge. So that moment of yes is that profound resolution at the core of my being that I am ready to live for the remainder of my life with my I linked to your thou. I and thou. You know about the couple, three o'clock in the morning, watching some television. What's on at three o'clock in the morning? Honeymooners, mash, whatever. And this burglar breaks into the house. He points a gun to the woman and says, what is your name? She says, my name is Elizabeth. The man says, it's your lucky night. Elizabeth was my mother's name. I don't kill people who carry my mother's name. Your life was just speared. He takes the gun and he points it at the husband. He says, what is your name? The man says, please, please, I'm an innocent man. Don't kill me. Tell me your name right now. And the man says, my name is Harry, but they call me Elizabeth. <laughs> that. For two people to make a commitment. My name is Harry. But they'll call me Elizabeth. One plus one should equal one is a unique level of commitment. It requires a value system that believes in a relationship. So that's why Rosh Hashanah, in many ways, is the most powerful day. Because it's the yes, I'm yours. It's not about taking out the garbage, or buying milk, or buying flowers, or going on vacation. Those are all the details that come afterwards. The first and basic thing is, do you belong to me? Do I belong to you? If that's missing, all the therapy in the world and all the techniques will not work. What's the problem among so many relationships today? They may have the details, but the essence is not there. The essence is a definition of identity. I am not me anymore, it's we. It's not me, it's we. Young people have to understand this. It'll make their lives much easier. And if you can make peace with that, then marriage could be much easier. Rosh Hashanah is when the Jew says, I'm yours, you're mine. The details, there's tefillin, there's Shabbat, there's kosher, there's mezuzah, there's learning, there's charity, there's prayer, there's education, there's integrity. Those are the details of Judaism. Just like marriage is about the details and the devil is in the details. A cardiologist once asked a famous rabbi, why do Jews have so many heart problems? So the rabbi said it's very simple because most Jews I know always tell me, I'm a Jew in my heart. So there's tremendous pressure on their hearts. They have to distribute their Judaism a little bit to their arms and to their legs, so their hearts will be alleviated. So the devil is in the details, but the commitment is on Rosh Hashanah. 
Once at a lecture, I was in uh, Durban, South Africa. How many of you have been to Durban? You were in Durban, okay, for the National Jewish Retreat. I was in Durban a number of years ago. A number of years ago, let's see, 13 years ago in 2000. In 2000, there was a conference of the United Nations on racism in Durban, South Africa. And do you remember what happened at that conference? There was one nation that was declared as a racist country. It was not Iran. It was not Libya. It was not Syria. It was not Afghanistan. And it was not Iraq under Saddam Hussein. It was Israel in Durban. Durban doesn't have a large Jewish community. It does have a nice Chabad house, of course, but there's a Chabad house on Mars too. We just don't know about it. But I promise you there is. There's a lovely Chabad in Durban. And the rabbi, the Chabad rabbi of Durban, Rabbi Shlomo, special man, special man. I remember I went there and uh, I didn't know about the, the system in, in Durban and Umschlange. And uh, I had a banana in my desk and a few monkeys came to visit me in my hotel bedroom uh, to share with me my bananas. And it was a very great experience. Welcome to Umschlange and Durban, South Africa. And the Jews felt, they felt hurt. Not many Jews, and here the UN condemns Israel in Durban as the only racist country left on the face of this planet. Quite amazing. And everyone is like, sure, sure. I mean, um, Americans, American ambassador left. God bless the United States of America. And he invited me to lecture at the JCC. It was a packed house. A few hundred people came. Jews, and I saw non-Jews came as well. I spoke about Israel. I mentioned that term that, as I told you last night, is very not PC. I mentioned the term CP, chosen people. A man raises his hand and says, excuse me, I cannot believe that a rabbi in 2000 should use a term that is racist. How dare you call the Jews chosen people? It's a racist term. I looked at him, I said, I have a question. Are you intelligent? What is he going to say? No. <laughs> he looked at me like I'm crazy. He nodded. I said, You're obviously intelligent. Shut. Are you tolerant? Obviously, you're tolerant. You're allergic to the chosen people. You're tolerant. Are you respectful? Are you a global spirit? Do you believe in the equality of all humanity? Of course. And you're handsome too. So you're almost perfect. You're handsome. You're intelligent. You're obviously articulate. You're tolerant. You're respectful. If that's the case, J'accuse! I have one question. Are you married? He says, yes, 23 years. From anybody else, I can accept the complaint of racism. But from you, how hypocritical. Why hypocritical? I said, how many women are there in the world? Three and a half billion? He actually knew the number. He was the type. <laughs> How dare you then call me a racist when your very life is all about racism? He says, what are you talking about? I say, how many women did you marry? He says, one. I said, how can you be so sexist? How can you look down at so many women? You have rejected three and a half billion women. And you have taken one. How does my wife feel? <laughs> she had to end up with a shmegagi like me. Instead of ending up with a handsome, tolerant, respectful, brilliant, 
global loving citizen like yourself. Yet, you disregarded all the women besides one. Fe. That's a disgrace that in today's society, a man should look down at so many women simultaneously is unheard of. And you're probably a professor too. Teaching about liberal ideals. I said, if you were an honest man, you should have got up to the world and said, here's the choice. Either I don't marry anybody, or I marry every woman. Woman. You marry every woman, that's fine. You don't discriminate. But you chose one woman, and you discriminate against every other woman. He looked at me, he says, Rabbi, are you normal? <laughs> I said, you can ask my therapist, but why don't you answer my question? Should I see you as a male chauvinist who looks down and disrespects women because you chose one? He says, absolutely not. I said, why not? And he said, Rabbi, just because I chose one woman to be my wife, that does not mean that all other women are not women. They're just not my wife. I respect them. I cherish them. I hold them in high regard and esteem. It's just not my wife. I said, Professor, what does that mean, your wife or your husband? He says it means that we're one. Professor, very good. God choosing the Jewish people does not mean any other human being is less human, is not important, is not in high esteem. It's the very Torah that made the credible statement that every human being, Jew and Gentile alike, was created in God's image. That every life has indispensable value and significance. It was the Jewish people who were mandated with the role, as we say in the Aleinu, to repair the whole world. It's the Talmud that says that the righteous among all the Gentiles have a portion in the world to come. It's the Talmud that states that the Jews have the responsibility to teach the seven Noahide laws so that every single human being can maximize their life on earth as an agent and ambassador of God in the world. The choice of the Jewish people is simply like a marriage. God entered into a marriage with the Jewish people. What is the definition of a marriage? One. When I have a spouse, I have many friends, I have business partners, I have colleagues, I have students, I have employees. But a spouse is only one. It's the person that you're one with 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A lot of men, by the way, don't understand this. They think when they go on a business trip, they're not married. They think when they go to the office, they're not married. And then when their wife calls them and says, so how are you doing? He's like, what do you want? I'm eating a pastrami sandwich and I'm watching a tennis game. Don't you realize we're not married now? That's because women are very different from men. As I told you once, Kabbalistically, men are waffles and women are spaghetti. Waffles, each waffle is a separate waffle, and no waffle touches the other waffle, and every waffle has walls where you put the syrup in, and you don't cross the border. <laughs> Women are spaghetti. One strand of pasta is intertwined and integrated with hundreds of other pieces of spaghetti. That's the fact. So for men, the brain is like a waffle. It's divided into compartments. That's how we work. We have a visual uh, filing cabinet in our brain with different folders and different names. We have one folder on which it says the car, another folder the house, a third folder, you'll forgive me, the wife, a fourth folder the children, a fifth folder the mother-in-law, a sixth folder my job. And when there's a problem in the car, we go to our brain and we subtly open up that folder very quietly. And we make sure it shouldn't touch any other drawer. We take out that file, we fix what we have to fix, we put it back, we close it, and we go to the next waffle. With women, it's exact opposite. With women, it's spaghetti. It's like a woman's brain is like the World Wide Web. 
Every experience is intertwined with hundreds and thousands of other experiences. Life is seen as one holistic, cholent experience where everything is integrated. There's no compartmentalization. That's why there was a time in history where polygamy could work only one way, not the other way. A woman, I'm married to you, I'm married to you. Men are capable of compartmentalizing. That's the fact. I, uh, I always tell couples a very important thing to know. Even if you just figure this out at the retreat, it's not too bad because it could, it could save many a relationship. And that is one of the complaints of many women is that their husbands don't know how to listen to them. Yeah, you ever heard of that? You don't know this. So I always tell husbands, you have to listen, you have to listen. Okay. So your husband comes back from the retreat and Rabbi Jacobson said you have to listen. So next week, Tuesday, you come home and he says, honey, I want to listen to you. And you're like, wow, wow, wow. Okay. He sits down on the couch, instead of picking up the newspaper and falling asleep within nine seconds or texting, he actually looks at you and he says, yes, please share how your day was. Messianic. Messianic. And he's actually the guy, he looks like a pre-1A child, and he's actually trying to do the right thing, you know? And, and you start, you, you, you let him have it. Okay, issue number one, of course, is... I had a very stressful day, you tell him. Extremely stressful day. He opens his filing cabinet in the brain. He makes a folder. He never had it before. It's called stress. My wife is stressed. He puts it back in the folder. He closes it. This takes like 10 seconds. The problem is by second eight, you go to the new subject. The next subject is that the cleaners ruined a $450 dress. And the guy doesn't want to take responsibility for it. So he goes to the filing cabinet. He never had a folder called the cleaners. So he makes a folder called cleaners. So, but it, it's, near, it's near stress. So he needs more space. So he has to call Google to give him more space in the brain. By now it's already 21 seconds, but you're already on to the third subject. The third subject is you're upset at your sister-in-law who did something in connection to your nephew's bar mitzvah that you don't like. So now it's like, whoa, a sister-in-law file. So now he's like, okay, she had a stressful day, number one, a file on the left, back left, the cleaners, $450, system of bar mitzvah. Then, second number 26, you go on to discuss your mother. Whoa, her mother. Second 30, you discuss his mother. Then there's the leak in the bathroom. Then there's the fact that your child is not happy in his school with his teacher, then there's the other child who's having other challenges in the other school, then you don't like your cleaning lady, you also don't like your job, plus you have a deadline for your boss tomorrow evening, it's now one and a half minutes. It's now one and a half minutes. And, and it's one and a half, and you discussed already 49 subjects. And you're just beginning, you're just beginning. Right? Now, your husband is opening drawers back and forth, back and forth, like this, like this, like this, like, and he's sitting there on the couch, and you're going on and on and on. And what happens is, at some point, he gets a migraine headache that's overbearing, and he can't deal any longer. So now he has a choice. Choice number one, which is more rational, is suicide. <laughs> however, however, he loves you, and he doesn't want you to remain a widow. So he doesn't want to kill himself. So what does he do? He does the second best choice. He falls asleep. <laughs> so as he's sleeping, what you think, what you think is his disregard to you is really his love to you. A woman knows marriage is holistic. It's not a waffle. That's what chosenness means. By Sinai, every Jew entered into a marriage with God. There is a oneness. The Jew may be religious or secular, may be atheist, agnostic believer, orthodox, conservative, reform, conservadox, right wing, left wing, centrist, centrist facing right, centrist facing left, modern, Chabad, Begel and Lux, renewal, Chabura, spiritual but not physical. But they're still married to God. They're holy, they're divine. It's a oneness. So on Rosh Hashanah, there is that commitment to acknowledge I am yours and you're mine. Yom Kippur, the chuppah. Sukkot, 
the dancing. Shmini Atzeres Simchas Torah. The wedding is over. We consummate the marriage. Intimacy. That's why on Shmini Atzeres we start praying for rain. What is rain? It's this cosmic sperm. It's the seed of the heaven that is internalized in Mother Earth and breeds throughout the winter and will ultimately produce the vegetation. Simchas Torah is the intimacy between the Jew and God, which is the reason for the dancing. The day after Simchas Torah is the honeymoon. Then comes the next month, the most boring month in the Jewish calendar, which represents the challenge of every marriage, and that is to discover our oneness and our commitment in the daily grind of life. Thank you. Click subscribe to see more exclusive content from the most sought-after Jewish speakers, teachers, and thinkers.